Delphine wasn't here to give a speech and be asked questions, so I'm not going to ask for questions. I'm going to ask for contributions, comments on the great speech that she gave us this morning and the contributions of where we want to go and how we can contribute to the growth of this great continent, which is called Dark Continent. But I think we, we, we need to shine the light, begin to shine the light of making Africa a very great continent and a, a bright continent, not a dark continent. With that, ladies and gentlemen and honorable guests, can I get some contributions in terms of what are your thoughts? What we need to contribute, what we need to add, where, where do we want to go? Should I go by tables? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you kindly. My name is Manas Mapela. I'm the CEO of Agon Asset Management. Uh, thanks, my sister Delphine. Uh, I mean, thought provoking. Uh, these things shouldn't be, it's not rocket science. Uh, I mean, I like what you said by saying. These things get printed, you see them on the hallways, um, they are on the websites, these are the values. Uh, if, if you know where I stand, you know me, Delphine, and uh, they always say culture is strategy for breakfast. Wow. Uh, it, it sounds like a cliche, and we've seen it with many firms, big, small, um, and <laughs> People just don't take that seriously. Uh, in our firm, and just a little bit on that, um, we went on a strategy review um, over the past few months. And when we created the strategic pillars, we deliberately, and these things have to be deliberate, deliberately we said the number one strategic pillar is culture, the urban culture. Mm. Uh, because you need to be deliberate about this. It's not what you have printed is what you do, how you do things. These things you must leave them. Because you see all these stuck contradictions. Yes, you mentioned examples such as Steinhoff. Those values have been printed there. Uh, if you read the book Steinheist, it covers all those and many other details that are not even covered there, where the former CEO talking to the chair of the board, even lying, saying, Yes, I'm going to Germany to get details mm. on what actually, to show that actually we didn't do anything wrong. You know what? Went to the birthday of Bruno in Germany. Mm. And finally, loved horse racing. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, and I'm a bit emotional because I've seen it in many firms. And even across our firms, you mentioned, you touched on issues of conflict of interest. Our youngsters there, we need to to sensitize them and, and what a better place to be and to have started with my sister Delphine uh, and my colleague Delphine on the, that um, you're going to write, write, uh, run into uh, um, challenges um, in the boardrooms, conflict of interest. I was talking to my brother Elias last night in our last chat before I went to bed. Um, you sit in the boardrooms, conflicts of interest. Somebody will be there saying, pay me some money. It's my money, pay. And you are supposed to deliberate as directors. Mm. He's sitting there. You ask the chair, the board chair, and say, uh, I know my CEO is sitting here looking at and I'm bringing all the <laughs> memories. And people will tell you, the board chair will say, what is that that you want to say in the absence of this person? Conflict of interest. So these are the realities we live with. We've seen them, some of us, in our own firms. Uh, but you need to be courageous. I mean, Delphine took us through all. I'm not going to repeat those. I'm really saying uh, there's quite a lot to have taken from that, uh, and let's really go more uh, and, and more and more in, in ensuring that we entrench this. I mean, purpose, trust, values, as you stated, not just to be printed. So I echo all that you've said. As somebody, as you know, who has gone through all those and challenges and, 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 and what of you to to fight against um, those crossroads, um, the gray areas. Uh, so one needs to be deliberate about these things. And thank you, Delphine, to have led this. So I look forward to to to, to, to more contributions uh, from colleagues. Here. Thank you. And I just wanted to, in in um, response to Manus, was to say that um, um, that we live this reality. And I think the hard part 
in being in a professional um, industry is that uh, we can con we can get caught up in the science of what we do, um, meaning the the numbers, the te the technical aspects. Um, but actually, what Manas is talking about is that the, the glue, this um, this golden thread, is actually the art, and it's the stuff that can't be seen. Um, but the most important word that Manas used was is deliberate. Um, and so that intentionality, I think, is perhaps the, the one thing that we've realized, particularly coming out of the pandemic, is that we took a lot for granted that things would just continue. You know, we'd have, you know, have all of these handbooks, we'd have all the, the how-to manuals as to what would happen. But actually, the only way you can translate um, those words um, is through intention into action. Um, so I just wanted to just um, really feel quite strongly to that whole notion of being deliberate. Um, I'm not surprised that culture came out as one of your most important strategic pillars in the work that you did as a firm. And I think it's quite, you might think it's ironic, we're standing here in 2022, we're talking about stock markets and economies and inflation and, um, and everything that's numerate, and we're having a, a discussion um, at business leaders on something that we can't measure in numbers. Um, because actually when we've come into the final analysis of it, is that it ends up being the most important thing. Um, it ends up being that barometer um, that, that guides how you make decisions about numbers. So um, thank you, Manas. I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Delphine. Um, I'm looking around before I get onto tables and say um, we need to make some... Everybody speaks because it's, 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 it's where we share ideas. It's, there's nothing scary about adding. Uh, uh, Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, Kim Robinson, I represent a New York-based law firm in Johannesburg, a firm that represents funds and investors to get their money back in cases like Steinhoff, where they lose money due to the fraud and misconduct of the investee company. Um, three points, and let me start with the conclusion. Please, let's not go back to normal. Normal got us here. I think one of my frustrations around the COVID pandemic is the clamor to get back to normal. That normal got us to the pandemic. I think going forward is to reject that normal and create something new and better and inclusive and just. Second, we're throwing around the word culture. And there are, I think, at least three different types, three different meanings of the word culture. And I'm not being pedantic. I'm being exact. People here talk about exact numbers. You can't be general about your fund or your numbers. You've got to be exact. Let's be exact about culture so that we can develop it in all its elements. So one thing about culture is the way we do things around here. And that's why I eat strategy for, for breakfast because up on the wall it says honesty, but you know that day to day you're bribing people to get business. So culture, one aspect, how we do things around here. Second, our creative production. I mean, the, the, the verses and the books that Delphine referred to. I mean, everyone here, the songs, you know, there's a soundtrack to your life. Is it R&B? Is it hip hop? Is it I'm a piano? Our cultural production, what images are we putting out there? The good, the bad, the ugly. Creative production is another part of culture. Um, and a third, traditions and practices, you know, that we probably grew up with in our homes, in our communities, in our religious organizations. So let's talk about those things very specifically to figure out how do we leverage them to create stories that we want to aspire to. Um, and then my last point. I think it's very easy to speak about values and ethics on a full stomach. Yeah. You know, so, you know, you talk, you know, okay, I guess a lot of us here, our wants and needs don't have to drive our actions. But let's say I'm a whistleblower in an organization. I whistleblow, I lose my job. Is there an NGO or someone that's going to feed my children who didn't ask me? to make that decision, and is, and is in that case the correct ethical decision to blow the whistle, or is it to ensure that I can do something to feed my children? So I think let's not be simplistic about how easy it is to live your values. Thank you. Getting to the core of our values and our integrity. Um, I think she raises, Kim raises a very important uh, part of it, that if, if your stomach is full, it's, it's easy to talk about values, these values, the right values. But we all know there's poverty and hunger in Africa. Very few people have full stomachs. And if you have a full stomach, we look at you like, um, where did you get it? 
Was it under the bed? Was it on top of your bed? Was it in your... Uh, so basically, we now don't know where we are. And, and, and great, 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 great input, uh, Kim. Thank you very much. One of the things that we, we and, and, and the, the, the fellow coach was talking about is that we, sometimes we talk to people about these values. What do you want? What, how do you want to see it? And says, you need allies. Organizations may have culture, but within that culture, you need allies. You need people that are going to support you because for women necessarily, you get to be ignored, you get to be shunted around, you get to be excluded in certain discussions because it was a boys' night. And obviously your contribution is not given the weight that it's supposed to be. So if you're all by yourself in the boardroom, whether the culture is wonderful, manas um, or whatever, if the whole organization doesn't buy into that culture, there's a big problem in the sense that you need to, act to change the entire culture of the organization and everybody deliberately have to do that within the organization. Uh, Nati, can you give Elia, Elia, okay, after Elias Delphine and then Nati, after Malmega speak, then we'll send it to, to, to the gentleman at the back, yeah. That, that last comment was exactly aligned to the line I said that human beings will always violate their values to meet their needs. Absolutely. Um, and that's exactly what I meant, is that we, it's impossible to have, and, and that ends up being the justification. And, and as a, as a subscale, um, you know, business owner in an industry that's very dominated by, you know, large, fantastic players, but large, um, that leave very little um, because of the skewness of our industry, um, I can assure you, and I'm, I know Manus, while a bigger firm than ours, um, I assure you that the, the, the playing fields are so unlevel that we will face continuously um, business risk. Um, it's real. So these are, you know, it might be a different status of what it means to have an empty stomach, but absolutely a real business risk. Um, and yet through it all, we've had to remind ourselves we cannot violate our values to meet those needs just for business survival. Mm. Absolutely. Elias? Thank you, thank you. My three points. I want to challenge the women in the room. Delphine spoke about how marginalized they are. How do you respond to the statement that says, like the white people say, blacks are their own problem? How do you respond to the point that women are their own challenge? That's for the women. The second grouping I want to deal with are asset managers. I see a lot of faces here who are in the business. What is the importance of asset management in today's governance? What is your role in today's governance? And I'll use an illustration, a South African illustration. It is said one of the biggest political risks in the existence of South Africa is ESCOM. Mm. Ah. <laughs> if that is true, how many of us have put money into ESCOM? Lastly, for asset managers, and this follows from your mother's book and your concept of culture. What do you see as the relationship between asset management and politics? And in this one, you need to take a very precise position as something was mentioned about being deliberate. The former minister of finance in South Africa used to call it, you cannot be half pregnant. <laughs> Either you're pregnant, or you're not. Thank you very much. My name is Isaac Rambuda. I'm from Rescura. One thing that's very interesting is when you talk business, you talk strategy. You forget that all those things exist because of people. We always concentrate on the other components that actually make a strategy. But the key, as you have said, is the people and how much do we invest in them to 
came that Sunday. Change doesn't come because we speak about it, but change comes because we do something. Sometimes that, I think that, that, that that's where the, the, the challenge is. <laughs> when people talk about strategy, talk about change. They even have change management agents. Mm -hmm. But the question is, did it start at the top? Because in most cases, the organization either rots or succeeds because of the top. Mm -hmm. And in leadership, people want to be led, want to lead, but they don't want to be led. And as leaders sitting here, good example is, are you able to be, are, are, do you have the ability to be led by other people for you to be able to lead other people? Because if you don't have the ability to be led, you're simply saying that you are actually above every person. Nobody can say anything. But believe me, there's wisdom right at the bottom of your organization lying there. If you can just open your eyes and your ears, you'll see it. There are people who work in office blocks or whatever. There's a security guy who always there in the morning and quit them. And mm. I say, I don't have. They've done you can ask them that they've never, never, never ever engaged with that person. But you know anyone who knows anything about everything in that building, that guy you pass at the gate. Yeah. It's like cleaners and people, domestic people who work within the, the factory. You want every to know anything about the company? Speak to those people. <laughs> they know everything. So from the people that we engage with on a day-to-day basis, that we pass, we don't even see. There's actually a lot of learnings we can get from those people. Most people don't have ties and good, uh, don't walk on heels. They don't, they are just ordinary people. But that's what life is. It's about ordinary people. And sometimes those of us who are privileged to sit at certain positions, we actually undermine those ordinary people. And but if you take care of your stuff, believe me, even when the days are dark, they'll always remember you because they know where their bread is buttered. And they know that whenever there is food, my manager, or my boss, whatever they call you, will always probably share with us. So when the bread is only left with one slice of bread, they understand that all of us will eat only from that one slice. When there's no bread, they understand that when there was bread, we did have something to eat. Thank you. I had to respond to that one. Absolutely. Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Sneng Lancha. I was known as Sneng Lamini from Old Mutual Investment Group. Um, I definitely had to, um, firstly, thank you to everybody for this really incredible um, and powerful conversation that we're having. Um, I had to respond to the one around um, women are their own uh, challenge. And I have a number of, uh, of thoughts um, around that. I think that, um, so let me tell you a little story. When I first started out in the industry a few years ago, um, one of my first um, business meetings that I went to was myself, and as is typical of in our industry, myself and three other gentlemen, um, I walk into the room, I would have been in my early 20s, um, walk into the room, the client, um, who is uh, would have been an asset owner, um, shakes everybody's hands, my colleagues' hands, um, and not mine. Um, we sit in this meeting, obviously I'm there at the table, completely doesn't acknowledge me, doesn't even look me in the eyes, um, and that was that. You know, we, we moved on and, hey, you know, you managed to survive um, this industry. Um, another friend of mine who is a portfolio manager was telling me a story about how they were engaging, um, they were engaging a company. And um, the, the, the broker who would uh, taken them to meet that company says, you know, I'm not really excited um, about, um, I'm not really excited about what I'm seeing in this company. Maybe it's, it's just this all-female um, leadership. And she like, obviously was in shock by this, um, but the meeting continued and that was that. 
And I think one of the, the important things that I think needs to happen and that we all need to take a collective decision around is, is calling that behavior out. And that behavior doesn't have to only be called out by the women, but I think the men must call the behavior out at that particular time when you, when you see it. I had a refreshing meeting where we went to see um, a, a client, a lady, and um, in that meeting, you know, she, she, she could see that there was, um, this was also some time ago, that, you know, I was being ignored and all of that in the meeting. And, you, you know, you're young, you're not as confident um, about speaking out. And I'll never forget it. the entire meeting, in, you know, on a table with senior individuals, she just looked me in the eye every time she spoke, every time she, um, she responded to a question, making sure that I'm included um, in, in, in the entire discussion. So, so calling out, um, you know, behavior that discriminates against women, I think is very important. Um, the other thing that I think is not discussed enough is around the support that women get at home. You know, we always talk about the, the business place um, because, you know, that's, that's where we, we all tend to meet. But at the end of the day, one of the key barriers for women progressing is that you give 100% at work, and then you give 90% at home because at home you're also the, 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 the one who's expected to, uh, to, to, to run things. So almost in this, um, the, this conversation around the progression of women, in a way, women are net negative, if I can say that. Because previously, as a woman, you'd be you know, at home, not really kind of... Um, uh, uh, I suppose, progressing in, in the workplace before, you know, equality and things like that. But then, you know, you didn't have to kind of contribute and, and be in the business world. And in gaining our, our place, we've gained on the business side, but the progress hasn't really moved on on the home front. And the same men that we have conversations with in forums like this in our own businesses, um, even the ones who really do advocate for women, in their own homes, not changing nappies, not cooking, <laughs> you know, not, uh, not really contributing. And I'd like to challenge the men in this room to not only fight the fight, um, you know, with women in, in the business place, but um, also in, in, in your homes, because it ultimately affects the overall uh, progress um, of women. Um, and then the, 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 I also think we need to rethink policies um, in companies. I was talking last night to, to Manas actually around uh, maternity leave. Um, and, and how we need to rethink, um, you know, some of those and actually what works for, I guess there's blanket policies and we assume that they work for all women. And, and I think we need to stand up and challenge, and challenge those. I've got a few ideas which, um, which I, I think we can also look at. And then my last um, point that I wanted to make was around um, what, is the, yeah, what is the role of managers, asset managers in, in governance. Um, and uh, Dr. Masalela made the example about ESCOM and how we put money in, you know, still put money into it. Um, and effectively, I think, um, I think it's, it's also our, our business view that it's challenging when you want to take an approach of let's not allocate the money. Basically, let's, let, let's screen out those that we don't want to work with because there's so many moving parts. Um, they are individuals who work in those businesses. Um, those individuals have families that, that they support. And, and so I think our model is more around let's engage, let's collaborate, let's get into spaces like this and discuss how we can all work together. Um, and as, also as businesses, as asset managers, let's not compete on <coughs> things that are actually the right thing to do. So being a responsible investor, um, advocating for transformation is not a competitive position. It's something that we should be doing collectively. So in engaging an ESCOM, you know, that's, you, you know, we're not competing when we engage them. We're doing something for the greater good. So that collaboration, these spaces, I think, um, incredibly um, important. But I don't think the answer is to say we will not, you know, put money. We will not engage those. The answer is actually engagement. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We just wanted to echo everything Sme said. Um, and one of the challenges, back to Elias, who said women are our own challenge, is that um, we all have fathers. And so the fathers in the room that have daughters, um, I don't think you should underestimate the extent to which you shape your daughter's image of herself. 
So about three or four years ago, the New York Times um, had done an exercise over many years where they tracked a cohort of, of, of young girls um, for over 20 years. And in fact, they looked at um, their final year of school, so 12th grade, and they looked at girls and boys in 12th grade, and almost around the world, this is true, even in South Africa, um, girls actually do uh, perform better on average out of school than boys do. Now, this is quite curious because you fast forward 10, 20, 30 years and you come to the world of work, where are those young girls? Where are those women? Um, and this is where the dad's role comes into play, and the moms, uh, speaking as a, as a mom, is that they realize that this was the missing link. And so if women are our own challenge, this is the link, is that the girls are raised to be perfect. Hmm. And so in the world of work, and especially in the financial world, perfection is not available. And so what was happening is girls were holding themselves back at the boardroom table for whatever reason, because and guys are not raised to be perfect, they're raised to be confident and bold. And so girls, my own daughter gets her report back and said, you know, great participation in class, but Mira must learn to put her hand up before she speaks. Um, guys don't get that in their reports, mm. boys. Mm. So my point that I'm simply saying is that if women can shed the pursuit of this, they call it the myth of endless perfection. That's the only challenge I'll take from, from Ilias. But it's actually how we also conscientize even the young women in our workplace that say, don't wait for the guys to ask the question because you're waiting for the perfect question. It's not available. Just ask the question. Um, thanks. And some of it, uh, hand, hand, hand of applause, please, because that's great. Just wanted to add something. That some of that culture comes from our own families, mothers and fathers. Don't, 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 don't be so assertive as a girl. You're not going to get a husband. As if getting a husband is the biggest thing that ever happened to humanity. But I'm going to throw principal the, the challenge to the boys to tell us, is it true? I know that girls mature quicker, but the competition when I was in primary, we called it higher primary. There were five of us, two girls and three and three guys. We were challenging for these positions and they, in four quarters, they alternate between the five of us. So I need to get that. But I'm going to give Manas and then give Lebu and then give the young guys there. Okay, thank you. Oh, there's an, oh, oh there's women are up. Okay, so this is probably my last, my last contribution. Um, no, 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 no. Just, nobody, uh, nobody, nobody is, is, is intimidating you. I'm in charge. It is good to see uh, colleagues uh, from our industry here. So we will try our best, uh, Brian, uh, to to get to, to some of the questions you raised. Uh, my sister's name, um, <laughs> uh, she, she got, or got us started on the governance side, um, you know, issues pertaining to ESCOM as well. Uh, yes, as asset managers or uh, asset management firms, we can do better. Uh, we are trying our best, but we can do better. Um, you did mention Snare, the issue of collaboration. And again, often, you know, many times, you know, people hide behind, I'm scared, it might be seen uh, to be like voting in concert, all those and excuses. We can collaborate. And even uh, PRI does make provision for that. Uh, principle for Responsible Investment, uh, UNPRI. We, it, there, there are tools for collaboration, many of them. Some of our colleagues, you know, Delfino raised things with some of us and say, guys, there is this entity, we are trying to raise this concern and we are not finding joy. Let's work together. There's a big difference between collaborating on issues of governance, uh, whether it's, uh, it has to do with proxy voting or just uh, engagements and all those. There's a big difference between voting in concert, which is illegal, we know. We are not saying let's break the, the law, but we can collaborate because some of us, yes, we are mid-sized firms, they are small-sized firms. If you just go alone, uh, in a lot of cases, your vote is not going. Yes, we'll have uh, exercised that, and we have done it at Agon Asset Management many times where we vote against particular things, and we do address and raise those concerns and talk to the board chairs, uh, chairs of the, those boards, to say our concerns are this, and that's why we voted against. Uh, and we're happy to, and we'll see them driving, coming to our offices, medium-sized as we are, 
um, no longer small. <laughs> so, um, and, and showing that the message did cut across, but are they going to really implement those or they just came to show face so that next time we vote for them because they listen to us? If the votes are not enough, um, they will continue with all that they've been doing. Um, so, so we need to collaborate. And when Delphine and us and Maz and many other firms, we say, guys, there's something. Uh, it shouldn't look like I'm supporting Delphine. Delphine knows we do respond if she raises something, uh, and then vice versa. So, so, so collaborating is one way in which um, you know we can uh, have our voices uh, really go through. Um, and having those records, publish, publishing those as well on our websites. I know most of us are not doing the best we can, but making sure it's not, you know, we worry that if we publish this on our websites that we voted against, we have issues, they will not honor our request for, for, for meetings. Because we still need to meet, our analysts need to meet those uh, company managements as we analyze the stocks. Uh, but those shouldn't be uh, excuses. There are many ways in which we can get our voices uh, gone. But yes, for Elias, there is a big role we can play as asset management firms uh, to shape those governance issues. Uh, Brahek, uh, as a grand th thanks my brother. Yes, you're right. Uh, if the center doesn't hold, um, then all hell breaks loose. So, the center must hold, but I did mention earlier sometimes that said in a lot of cases or some cases. Yes, what is that that you want to say in the absence of Elias Masilan in this meeting? Go ahead and tell us how you vote. <laughs> Conflict of interest. So the center must hold, but I also believe that in building the added to the no, so I shouldn't say but because it's like I'm negating that. So I also believe in inclusivity in the true sense. As we have gone undergone, as we as we uh in started our uh, journey on uh, reviewing our strategy. Another deliberate effort, or, uh, uh, we were deliberate in saying our inclusivity will mean follow the Google type model, do it bottom up, involve everyone in the firm uh, as you build all those. So, uh, and I'll tell you the beauty of that is you end up with those programs being, the, the strategic programs being championed by your colleagues. As the CEO, you are there, you are enabling that to happen. So we've got many people who might thought actually they could lead, some women and all that. In fact, we ended up reviewing our management committee from an all-male choir, as I used to call it, to four women out of nine members of that. Uh, we've just done that recently. It's a deliberate effort as well, empowering those. I'm sitting with some of them here, Dr. Mtlaji, uh, who has joined the management committee. Uh, she's also a member of the strategy committee. So in April, you, you become deliberate, and sorry, I'll keep recycling that. Because if you don't do that, then there'll be a problem. And that way you make your life easier. I was saying to Elias last night, because when you do the KPAs, then you have proper cascading KPAs. You can hold everyone to account. They say buy-in, everyone is acknowledged, is included. That becomes the best way. As opposed to getting a strategist from um, uh, I don't know, McCain's or whatever, the, you get this blueprint, it accumulates dust, you have done it, you still ignore your security guards, you ignore all the other low-level employees. Uh, that's, I don't believe that's the, the best way to go. So do it bottom-up, but the centre must hold because that's how you set the top. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am Babando from the Hamaboza from South Africa, and I would like to thank my friend who has invited me to this prestigious event. Uh, my plan was to keep quiet today, but when you raise issues on women, then it touches a bit of <laughs> I'm going to start by saying, being a woman is a difficult job. Just being, by being a woman, before you start doing anything in your life. Sitting around here today as number two, 50% of the women that are in this room, about 50% of them have been abused. So that's the second thing that you have to start thinking of when you see a woman in your boardroom. Have we been supporting enough? Because these are things that are a reality. They might not be directly, we might not be directly involved in them as the organization, 
but you must know that these are some of the issues that the women are dealing with. So most probably at the end, as we as I go towards how do we strategically then support women, we need to make sure that we've got to have policy that supports that the organization, at least those that do have within the organization, can start promoting the fact that women need to be looked at and say how do we support them, because we know that this is the problem that they are facing. Going back to the question that has been asked, are women to blame for what they are going through? Yes, the big yes. Number one, if South Africans did not stand up towards apartheid, we would be still having the same predicament. Only women understand the pain of being a woman. If we don't regroup as women and come together and fight what we are going through on a daily basis, including just walking on the streets. If a man comes towards you, you don't know if you want the phone, you do not know whether you need to drop the phone or you need to pull your bag close to you. So what women are going through is a worse pandemic. How do we as women below the policy imperatives that are there regroup to make sure that we are going to win the fight that we are going through? Sometimes as much as we need support from men, but I think it is very important for us to come together beyond, we do have policy, policy imperatives that is supporting us. What are we doing about it? Number three, women are the creators of human being through whatever system we can call it. I'm not suggesting they're the only ones that co-create, but we are the ones that make people and we bring them here. And even with the current systems, we are the ones that bring them up. How are we bringing them up? How do we need to correct this? This might not be a direct business discussion, but what the person becomes, this person is coming out of your hand. So what do we create? What have we created? And what are we creating for the future? Number five, if it's five, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Women do unpaid labor. And nobody talks about it. It doesn't mean you need to be paid money, but people need to know what you are worth. If I am cleaning your house and I'm washing your dishes, I need to say you might not give me the hundred thousand by the end of the month, but you must know. We need to move away of not talking from about unpaid labor. Because you are sitting there and the people are developing themselves. If you are starting as a woman towards a program, you come back from home and you still do the unpaid labor and then you go back and you do the other thing. And most probably if you are married, because that transaction also, a sexual transaction is very important for your own success. There are very good con conversation around people that have got good sexual lives and how they become wealthy. <laughs> from the bedroom to the bathroom. But women, because after work, they have to go home and start working. Do you have time for the sexual transaction? Mm. In the morning, we can see the way you are working that you did not get it all this morning and the whole business goes down. Because you are not happy. Because you invest almost all your time on unpaid labor. Wow. We as women, indeed, we have created what is happening to ourselves. Leadership, the current leadership that we have, Mainly, if you look at all the tools that have been made available, they come from the Western culture and they come from masculine and from men. Have we come across to say, we need to move forward, we need to understand how women function, and so what kind of leadership would they, they have to have, which is scientifically proven, that a male leader cannot be the same as a female leader. I would li like at some point you to cover that as a nugget. So when we put it in our website as the outcome of this, of this, of this session, we, we're very clear, okay. very, very clear about what we want to achieve and what we, we are recommending. Okay, yeah. definitely. But, but then how do we then translate female leadership? I love what you said when you was asked. I didn't listen to the conversation on, on YouTube. I'm going to look for it. Because there's one thing that we have done, that we have taken all the Western tools and the, all the masculine tools, but we left African tools. And when we talk of culture, it's something that's very important to say. My CV is not made by what you see, but it is made by the people around me. Because that's Africanism. We are made by people. So what is it that we can learn? There are all these things that we, uh, 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 black people are lazy. We are not lazy. We are expected to do things, something outside of our genetic makeup. 
So it looks like we can't do it. Have we been studied enough that somebody knows exactly what is it that we can do and how? Have we come to the fore to say this is who we are as women and these are the values now of womanhood? How do we take the women's values of womanhood and translate them into business? Because that's what is important is that it's better to do what you are made of and translate it into something that makes sense and that somebody else will be able to see it uh, on another day in a different way. Us as women, we come, we, we, we are very good in doing uncomfortable things to ourselves. I'm looking forward to the day when men are wearing high heels. <laughs> <laughs> we better have to round off a bit. We go, we go, to, we go to dinners. Yeah. White dresses like this is uncomfortable. Mm. But men will be wearing suits and maybe five dresses underneath. <laughs> so we allow and perpetuate these things for ourselves. Mm. And we then want to start blaming people. We need to change. Mm. Lastly, we, can open this place. we have sexualized ourselves mm. as women. Instead of sometimes there are women that do it and it's a reality, even in the business sector. Instead of making yourself to be an intellectual that people get to see your mind, you go to work with something like this. So we have created a lot of problems within the space. So if you sexualize yourself, people will see yourself as a sexual okay. If you then decide to make yourself an intellectual, people will see that other side. But from a policy point of view, I think we've got a lot of support that is there already, that is ongoing, but we just have to grab and move with. But also there is still a bit that needs to be done. How do we force businesses that are main owned to say, before you do business with anyone, do business with a woman? And that you need to do a quarter of about 15 to 20 percent that it needs to be women businesses. Why is that it's only women businesses that are suffering while men businesses are not? We are we have been at the back. We have been the ones that have been looked at behind. So it's important that all the men businesses, from a policy perspective, that you say all your businesses, you need to make sure that you give 20% to women businesses. And if they are not ready, it is your responsibility to make sure that they are ready because your mother also was not ready because they had to raise you. Thank you so much. And running away. So, thank you. Now I need nuggets that we're going to just you, put together. Thank yes, Director, Your Excellency, the Right Honorable Prime Minister, and the head table, and all esteemed um, guests in this esteemed gallery. Um, it's my first time to attend uh, Wamakoko name, Business. Please. Um, my name is Linda Kamalo. Okay. I'm the CEO of Aswadin Tourism Authority. Wow. Um, I'm here for the first time, and before COVID, I had a good meeting with Bob Masilela, and our aim was to partner and, and, and to market the event from a tourism perspective. I'm quite pleased, uh, Bob Masilela, that there's a, there's a huge number of South Africans in this meeting, and that is really heartwarming for us as tourism, because it, it has a, 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 a GDP meaning contribution to, to, to this country. Um, I, I do want to, to just add a voice, you know, not only to the women conversation, but to the whole leadership conversation that is happening here and the culture conversation as well. From a culture point of view, and I, I will lean towards tourism. From a culture point of view, culture is what drives tourism into this country. And what underpins our culture as a Maswati is respect. Respect for oneself, respect for, 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 for others, respect for, 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 for business. And, and you know, I believe that that culture is what makes Eswatini a, a, a safe place to a very large extent. Because the Maswati are warm, the Maswati are people who are welcoming and we do have Ubuntu, the African you know, uh, culture fabric that runs through the entire continent. Having said that, I think um, from a business point of view, leaving the values, I like, I like um, what Delphine said when she spoke, um, leaving the values is critical. What we've done in, in our organization is, is, you know, to instill the values, you do need to let every single person understand what the values are, and then we reward people who leave the values. Because when we work, we, we actually monitor and, and we also include it intentionally. Intentionally, I, I like what my brother said about intentionality. Intentionally, we include, include it as well on our scorecards mm -hmm. to say the person who will leave values needs to, to really be measured because what you cannot 
measure you cannot manage yeah. so so yes just just at the highest level i think that that, that is how we, we we contribute towards that and then going into culture and leadership leadership is predominantly about um, power and influence and i think all of us here have a significant amount of power and influence and we do need to be intentional about how we influence our spaces within which we work how we influence our surroundings as well our people as well so that the entire society can be impacted you know positively i know that there's a there's, there's a lot of of um ills that are out there so, so, so societal ills that are out there as a result um you know of, of people not living their values, the issue of conflict of interest in the workplace, it goes it, it, it goes beyond just that. There's a, there's a lot of moral injustices that happen outside that are mainly caused by a lack of, of integrity um, at the highest you know level. I, I like the saying that when you when you spoke about the issue of the fish rotting from the head, um, and I take that and I take it as a challenge for all of us. Now, going to the interesting subject of women and their own um, problem that, that Marcelina spoke about, I, I believe that all of us need to play a part. Everybody needs to play their part in making the society we live in and the, the workplaces we, we, we live in to, to, to be meaningful for the other person. This means that men need to understand women and women need to understand men. Um, when, when, as I grew up, I actually googled the differences in the brain of a man and the difference in the brain, how, how a woman's brain works and how a man's brain works. And I found that that is real. Men are extremely different from women. And women are extremely different from men. So we need to have an appreciation of that so that we can cohabit and support each other as we journey through this thing called life. You know, um, I'm, I've been married for 24 years now and I've learned that it's important to understand each other. And I must say that I know there's a lot of issues about men and, and women and all, but I'm one of the blessed women because my husband supports me 100%. And and he, he understands that sometimes I can't come home and cook because of the work that I do. And I don't think I would be at the position I am in if he wasn't the man that he is in terms of supporting me. He even... <laughs> even he even supported me to, 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 to study and get my master's degree and all of that. So if all the men would support not only their sisters and their mothers, but if that would cascade down to, to really us all living nicely and peacefully in this world, that would be nice. Men are very um, um, entitled in the workplace. Mm. And I think it goes to, it goes to what um, Dolphin said when she said, um, may, they are taught from a tender age. And I do think this Africanism, this African culture, does that to us um, as well. So, so I think we need to raise our girls, give them that confidence, raise them with confidence so that they can be able to deliver more. And lastly, um, I think it's important to understand our strengths as women. Women are very detailed. So, so because we are detailed, we make better project managers and we add more value in the business space as well. So we need to leverage on our strengths and we need to really make our voices heard from a business point of view as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much.